I am Danielle Ashbach. I'm the All Tech Project Manager for Access, and I am joined today by Dara Johnson, our Program Development Officer. We have a couple housekeeping items uh, to start with. So everyone will be muted until the end of the presentation, um, after which you can use the raise your hand feature, and I will allow you to unmute yourself to um, ask any questions or give us any comments you have. Um, you can also type a question through the chat or the Q&A um, little box thingy. <laughs> um, if you use the Q&A um, the Q&A feature, you can like other people's questions, and that will help us prioritize what we need to address first. Um, yeah, I think that covers it. Uh, I would just like to remind everyone, and I'll remind you a couple of times throughout, um, we do need you to submit your public comments in a written format. Um, so you are free to tell us whatever you like um, during this webinar, but to have your comments officially recorded, we'll need you to email them or snail mail them to us. And I'll provide how you can do that at the end of the presentation. Um, just we don't want you to depend on Dara and I uh, to record your thoughts appropriately. Uh, and I will throw it over to Dara to get us started. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dara Johnson with Access. A um, <clears throat> little bit about the purpose for today's session. We started discussing the HCBS rules back in 2015. And so uh, we've had a couple of engagements or reconnections with you over the years, but this is really kind of our final, our final um, major engagement before we receive final approval on our plan. And then we move into the more of the monitoring and maintenance mode of the HCBS rules. So wanted to re-engage and reconnect with all of you. Um, we wanted to provide information to you regarding um, kind of our progress and where we are with compliance with the HCBS rules as the deadline is looming, um, which is March 2023. And um, we're actually soliciting public comments specifically on um, an addendum that we created on the statewide transition plan. Um, if you remember the statewide transition plan, think it's 250-ish pages. Um, and um, so what we wanted to do is provide a shorter document with you, providing you with significant progress updates, including our progress on the um, first round of assessments for all of the settings that need to comply with the HCBS rules. So that's why we are here today um, visiting with you, and we thank you for your time this afternoon. Next slide. So the agenda, well, just to make sure um, that we're all called kind of on the same page, we'll do a few get, get back to the basic slides and talk a little bit about our program, what's unique about it, what are the intent of the HCBS rules, and what's the opportunity for us at the state of Arizona. And then Danielle will get into the very specifics and, and again, also doing a little bit of a reconnection with you around how we conducted the assessment. Um, how we trans, uh, how we supported um, compliance with HCBS rules during um, at the onset of the public health emergency and during a little bit about the heightened scrutiny process, which is CMS's process for us to elevate um, settings to them that um, may have institutional characteristics, but that we feel like those settings can still come into compliance with the HCBS rules. And then just an overall picture of what we found during that first year of assessment. And then more importantly, um, to talk about um, how we, where we go from here and, and maintaining compliance and some ongoing monitoring, including some ways that you can help us with ensuring compliance, ongoing compliance with the HCBS rules. So a little bit about our program. I think this provides just some helpful context for um, the home and community-based settings rules. So um, Arizona operates our, our Medicaid program under an 1115 waiver. Um, that's a demonstration waiver. That means that we um, have always done unique things 
in Arizona, we have had to ask special permission from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to waive or to deviate from existing Medicaid regulations. One of the other aspects of our program is um, since its inception, we've um, used the managed care model for our program, uh, which means that we, um, instead of providing the services directly, we offer um, members to choose a health plan to provide their services. And specifically as it re relates to the long-term care system or the Altex program, um, we've provided integrated care delivery. So if members are um, aging or have physical disabilities, they receive all of their services, physical health care, behavioral health care, and their long-term care services through one health plan. Um, if members have a developmental or intellectual disability, um, they receive their long-term care services and supports through DDD. And then DDD contracts with two health plans um, that uh, members can choose from that provide physical health and behavioral health services. So it's been very important to us to make sure that members have to go to the least amount of places to get the care that they need and, and to make sure that coordination happens um, as we recognize the individual as a whole person. A couple of the um, unique and interesting facets of our long-term care program. Um, since the very beginning, um, we have been focused on serving people in the least restrictive setting. We recognize it's important for their quality of care, but it also helps reduce costs. We have a number of guiding and governing principles um, that we uh, utilize in our program to help us make decisions over the years and certainly line up with the HCBS rules. So again, least restrictive setting is one of those, making sure that we have persons that are planning, um, that's driven by the member and their family, making sure that um, we have a network of providers that can provide services in the community, making sure those uh, providers are accessible to them. Um, and then last but not least, one of our governing principles is that we engage stakeholders and we um, involve stakeholders in the process. And so that's certainly one of the reasons why we're in front of you today. I'll talk a little bit about placement rates um, that also makes this unique from other states. We'll show you a chart in a moment. And then one of the other things is that we've worked really hard to create specialized settings um, as members needs evolve. Um, as we introduce new members into our system that have unique needs, we wanna make sure um, that we're offering those settings where they can receive services and, and have their needs met. This is obviously an area for growth and opportunity always as those needs evolve. So um, we look forward to um, some future efforts um, around that in particular. Next slide. A little bit about placement rates. So if you look at our long-term care program across the Division of Developmental Disabilities and our aging and physical um, health contractors, our long-term care health plans, um, about 90% of the membership is receiving services in their own home or in an alternate community-based uh, community setting, like an assisted living or a group home. So um, that's something in other states, oftentimes that's what um, more and more people are in skilled nursing facilities or institutional settings. Uh, so we're very proud of that. And that's been one of the main tenets of our program since the very beginning. We've offered financial incentives and other incentives with our program, with our contractors to make sure that we are providing services in that least restrictive setting. And certainly good, a good framework for what the um, HCBS rules afford us and the opportunity. Next slide. A little bit about the HCBS rules. Um, they are called the Home and Community Based Setting Rules. Um, we call it HCBS rules for short. That's certainly a mouthful. Uh, one of the main purposes of the rule or intent is to enhance the quality of, of the services, the home and community based services. So, certainly, not only do we want to um, provide quality of care, but we want to make sure that there's quality as it relates to member outcomes and member experience. We look at these rules as rights or protections for individuals. So it also gives us a, an opportunity to focus on what are those things that we should be making sure that our members are able to participate in, have access to, um, and use that as a standard um, for our program moving forward. One of the other purposes is to assure that members have the full access to benefits of community living. Well, what does that mean? 
One, we want them to make sure that we're constantly and continually remembering um, to focus on serving them in the most least restrictive setting. So they have access to the community and an ability to build relationships and um, access goods and services in the community, much like you or I, who may not be an all text member. And we wanna make sure that their experience with the community is the same extent as anybody else. Um, so that's also, um, uh, like I said, access, um, relationships, um, opportunities to participate, employment, volunteerism, those other kinds of activities are important and, and add quality to our life. While the least restrictive setting is not a difference for us, um, since that's been a focus um, since the onset of our program, it does shift our culture a little bit. And we've definitely seen that um, since 2015 over the last seven years. Um, and many of you have played a significant role in that. And um, uh, in really looking at these rights again, uh, or these rules as rights, but one of the things that shifted a little bit, um, which we think in the positive is that people don't have to earn these. Um, they automatically get these rights and protections and opportunities, but we do need to be careful and mindful of those opportunities that might um, impact a member's health and safety. So we certainly don't want to jeopardize a member's health and safety. So we look at restrictions, we look at those being temporary, and most importantly, above all, we look at any restrictions um, to these protections under the HCBS rules to be individualized. Um, and we also don't put them on a shelf. Um, so we don't say, well, everybody in the group home, nobody can um, you know, have visitors um, or nobody can go out after 5 p.m. Um, if there's a reason why that needs to be restricted for one person, it's restricted for them. And then we work with that individual to support goal development and other things to help them be able to have access to that in the future. So there's a change in our system and the way we've and have culturally worked through these issues with members previously. Next slide. So talked a lot about basic rights. So this is an opportunity for us to create a new standard. Um, also to reinforce the least restrictive setting. Just wanna make sure that never um, uh, changes as a priority for us. And then really gives us an opportunity to then um, build upon that to really look at are we it's great members are served. 90% of members are served in their home or in an alternate community setting. Um, but are those members engaged? Are they participating? Um, do they know, do they have relationships with people that aren't individuals that work with them or individuals in the program? Are they able to see their family members? Are they able to contribute um, to their community and participate in a way that's meaningful to them? And so that's really the impetus behind our opportunity with you with Arizona's unique um, positioning prior to the HCBS rules and what we continue to look uh, upon as far as emphasizing and monitoring here in the years to come. Next slide. I think this is where I turn it over to Danielle. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dara. All right. So uh, before we get into the meat and potatoes, I uh, just wanted to level set. Um, so settings that are not considered home and community based and do not have to um, comply with the rules. Um, that's going to be nursing facilities, hospitals, intermediate care facilities, um, basically those those settings that are institutions. Um, they, they will not be complying with the HCBS rules at this time. So the settings that do have to comply are settings like assisted living facilities, group homes, developmental homes. Um, we do have some non-residential day programs and employment programs that also must comply with the rules. So uh, we'll go back uh, in history a few years. Uh, back in August of 2019 until about March of 2020, um, access facilitated work groups to create an assessment tool suite to be used by the health plans to assess that settings compliance with the HCDS rules. Uh, these work groups consisted of members, family members, providers, and MCOs. And ultimately, we came up with four tools for assessing compliance. 
um, the provider self-assessment. The reason we created this tool was to gather information directly from the provider uh, to determine how compliant they are with the HCBS rules. It is important to note the provider self-assessment includes both the provider's response and documentation from the health plan validations of the provider's response um, after a joint review of the self-assessment with the provider on site and the completion of the additional tools in the assessment tool suite. So the process really begins with the provider self-assessment and then these three additional tools and the on-site visit from the health plan to validate that provider self-assessment. One of those tools is the observations and community interview tools. Um, this is to be used by the health plan when they're on site, um, you know, to actually observe what's going on in the setting, um, understand what's going on in the environment and community engagement of the provider um, to identify any characteristics that may or may not be consistent with the HCBS rules and to gather information directly from community members uh, which doesn't mean asking anyone off the street. It's usually people who are involved in the setting in some way. Um, could be a mailman, could be someone that comes in to teach a class. Um, it's going to look different depending on the provider. Um, and we ask those questions to get an understanding about the provider's level of interaction with the members receiving services and the strategies the provider employs to maximize community engagement. We also have the person-centered plan review. Uh, person-centered planning, obviously a huge component of HCBS rules. Um, while it is not completed at the setting, we do review member case files uh, to make sure the provider is compliant with decisions that are made during that person-centered planning process. And finally, the member surveys. So while those health plans are on site at the setting, we want them to talk to the members and see how they're feeling about the choices they're given, uh, the way in which they're able to engage in the community, uh, decisions they're able to make that are meaningful to them in their life. Uh, so that is a, a short survey we ask the health plans to complete so they can um, make sure they hit all those points and have those conversations with the member. Uh, again, just to validate that um, provider self-assessment and that provider is compliant with the HCBS. Danielle, did you? Oh, your call dropped. Okay, one moment. Everybody will wait for Danielle to come back on. Technology is great <laughs> sometimes. Bear with us for a moment. Thanks for the humor, Susan. <laughs> no, we're just waiting. Um, while while we're waiting for Danielle to rejoin us, just want to highlight that I am managing the text um, in the chat and the Q&A. So if there's something that um, even you want to address when it's time um, to um, at the end of the session, feel free to drop in the question and um, we can then kind of roll call through that if there's something you don't want to forget that you have a question about as Danielle works through um, the session. But we are getting uh, close to the time in the session when you all can um, uh, share your thoughts and feedback with us. Danielle, are you back on? I am. I'm so sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I can only blame AT&T because I wasn't even touching my phone. Okay, so we just talked about the assessment tool suite. Um, so 
if you recall the time frame uh, we had developed all these was um, we we created them and finished them around March of 2020. So uh, then the world stopped <laughs> and um, you know COVID-19 hit. So uh, the quality monitoring process that was planned for March of 2020 was put on hold initially because of public health emergency. Um, but we still wanted to make sure providers had as much information about their HCBS compliance as soon as possible um, and that the health plans could continue assessing compliance during the pandemic. At that point, the, um, the deadline to comply had not changed. Um, so it was really important that we found a way to work through the pandemic and still assess for HCBS compliance. So uh, we created the COVID-19 transition plan. And this plan allows providers to explain how their service delivery was changed so that they could still provide services while minimizing the risk of COVID-19 transmission. Along with helping providers understand areas they may need to work on to be compliant with HCBS rules, uh, the, pandem the pandemic also provided us with an opportunity to kind of think about how they could improve service delivery and compliance once it was safe to do so. Um, you know, so thinking, how do we get back to better than normal once we can start going out to the community and once people can start coming back to the setting? Um, so it really just gave us the chance to kind of think through that. Um, Settings were assessed with that COVID-19 transition plan and a modified self-assessment form starting in March of 2021. Um, that COVID-19 transition plan is now optional as of December 2021, but will remain an option for providers um, who may need it based on the members they serve and the status of the public health emergency. Uh, as we all know, that has not been listed just yet, so we want to keep that option available. All right, get back into it. <laughs> um, so I wanted to share, uh, this is just a screenshot of our website um, to prepare providers for um, the assessment and re-engage the provider network around HCBS compliance. Um, between March and April 2021, Access facilitated a total of six training sessions, including a general training session about the COVID-19 transition plan, and then we had five setting-specific sessions. Um, the sessions were designed to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer discussion for providers to share innovative programming ideas that support compliance with the HCBS rules um, during and outside of the public health emergency. Those sessions also helped highlight topics for another round of sessions that will be scheduled very soon. And those will focus on the provider's role in person-centered service planning and strategies to support family members who may inadvertently limit their loved one's ability to be an active participate in their community. Uh, so some of those tougher discussions. But you can find the training sessions we did have. They were all recorded. And they're on our website under HTBS Provider Training. So now we'll get into the actual numbers. So again, it was March of 2021, the health plans began assessing all of the settings for HCBS compliance. Um, it's important to note that any finding of non-compliance requires a corrective action plan. Uh, this corrective action plan from the health plan um, gives them the opportunity to provide technical assistance on the deficient items and requires that they follow up with the provider uh, in a regular manner to ensure the provider is compliant with the HCBS rules by March of 2023. Um, so some of those items that would have a uh, corrective action plan or cap um, are those in that um, this come in, can come into compliance category. Um, that would mean they, they didn't meet all the items and so they would have a cap issue so the health plan could follow up. Um, you can see our results are broken out into the following compliance categories. We have fully compliant, meaning they met um, every item on that provider self-assessment and didn't need any follow-up, can come into compliance. Again, they were issued a, a corrective action plan, but they are expected to be able to comply. 
by the deadline of March of 2023. And then we have not compliant, which would mean the setting is not in a position to comply with the HCBS rules or that they don't want to comply. Um, luckily, and, and this is what we had figured from the beginning, we don't have any settings that fall into that criteria of not compliant. Um, so we're very happy the data reflected that. So this is that same chart just in percentages um, in case it makes it a little bit easier to look at it from a higher level. Um, let me see here. You can find a full report of this on our website or by you know setting by setting. And I'm going to talk to you in a little bit about where to get that report and tips on how to review it. So heightened scrutiny. <laughs> CMS created this process called heightened scrutiny, and it's for states to preserve settings that are initially presumed to have institutional qualities and therefore presumed not to be compliant with the HCDS rules. So those uh, institutional qualities are these three prongs, um, settings that are located in a building that is also a publicly or privately operated facility that provides inpatient institutional treatment, settings that are in a building located on the grounds of or immediately adjacent to a public institution, or any other settings that have the effect of isolating individuals from their broader community. So if the setting meets these prongs, but we still feel they can comply, um, we use the heightened scrutiny setting to submit, or heightened scrutiny process to submit evidence to CMS to make that final decision. Um, to determine you can see the first two prongs are pretty black and white. Um, that last one, we had to work with a work group to figure out how to determine if the setting is isolating individuals. Um, so we reconvened those setting specific stakeholder work groups to develop some standard criteria and a threshold to flag those settings that may have this quality of an institution. Those work groups identified which requirements that if a setting was not compliant with, could be a contributing factor to the member's isolation from the broader community. Um, those requirements are noted in bold text on the provider self-assessment tool, which is also available on our website. Um, and further, they, they establish a threshold that three or more of those contributing factors of isolation, so those bolded items, that if they were not met, that setting would then be flagged for heightened scrutiny as possibly isolating them. And again, heightened scrutiny doesn't mean the setting can't comply. Um, all of the settings we identified that needed heightened scrutiny, uh, we determined that they can comply with the HCDS rules. They just might have a little bit more work to do. So these are the results of our heightened scrutiny um, uh, findings. Uh, there are some settings in this that met more than one criteria for that uh, heightened scrutiny presumption. Um, and again, you can find the detailed information in our HCDS assessment report, which we'll jump to now. Um, it's available on our website. This is just a screenshot of how it looks on our website, um, which I'll we can put the link in the chat for the website, but also it's, it's, um, I have it later on in this um, presentation. But essentially, so this is a very detailed report. We do have some directions here on um, how to look at the report. It will pull up as an Excel file. And then I have some tips on reviewing it because it can be a little bit overwhelming. So it's split up into uh, four tabs. You'll see the screenshot here. There's the day program, employment program, CDD residential, and ECD residential. If you are looking for a specific setting, you'd want to make sure that you select that correct tab it might fall under. And then I would recommend using Control F or the Find feature to search for that specific site you're looking for. If there are multiple sites by the same name, you can try searching by the city or address if you have that information. 
um, there are um, we we brought in this to four categories, but I can tell you under employment program that's where you'll find center based employment and group supported employment. The DDD residential tab includes group homes and developmental homes, as well as um, individualized living arrangements. I'm missing a word in there, ideally. So, <laughs> and EPD residential is pretty much just the assisted living facilities. But um, so just, just so you know, you kind of want the general um, category it might fall under if you're looking for something specific. So when you pull up the report, um, you'll see settings that are um, that met that heightened scrutiny criteria. They'll be highlighted in yellow, so they're easy to see. And then if you uh, scroll over on the report to your right, um, you can find all of the items that a cap was issued for. Um, these are just numbers, so they don't mean anything, <laughs> just looking at it. Um, but these numbers correspond with the items on the provider self-assessment that the provider was found not compliant with. Again, uh, that being found not compliant doesn't mean that they can't comply. Um, it just means the health plan issued a corrective action plan so they can follow up with the provider and ensure they are compliant uh, by March of 2023. And this is just a screenshot on our website where you can find that provider self-assessment tool. It's under our provider tools uh, drop-down menu. And then it will look like this when you click on it. So again, we have those four broad categories. Oops, sorry about that. Those broad categories that it may fall under. We have the COVID-19 transition plan uh, documents, if, if that's what they uh, completed and then the regular HDBS assessment document. When you click on those zip files, it'll bring up that assessment tool suite that we talked about initially. So those observation tools, person centered planning tools, the self-assessment, and the member survey. And the companion guide is uh, more for the providers and health plans on kind of what we're looking for that might demonstrate compliance. Just goes into it a little bit more. So, all that to be said about the report, uh, it will take a minute to digest, but we'll go ahead and move on. If you have a concern about a specific setting that you feel access should be aware of, um, because you may you feel they may not be able to comply or they may be isolating members, you can report that information directly to us through our website. So it'll be on this how to report HCBS rules compliance concerns for a specific setting tab, it's a mouthful, but when you click on it, um, it brings down this information and this online portal is a link. So when you click on that link, a short form will pop up that you can fill out to provide us with details. Um, please be sure to state that your concern is specific to HCBS setting compliance and you can report your concerns anonymously. All right, so now we'll switch gears and talk about responsibilities for compliance and ongoing monitoring. Um, since the HDBS rules are the new standard for compliance moving forward, um, Access has taken on the following activities to incorporate the HDBS rules into our normal policies and procedures, um, including working to uh, update several AMPM policies. Um, we have some of them listed here. We're actually continuing this work. Um, so if you're signed up for those um, policy public uh, comment notices, you'll, you'll have noticed <laughs> that we're updating these and we'll continue to update them. Uh, we're also working on updating, or we have updated the provider participation agreement to ensure that new providers coming into the network attest to their understanding of the HDBS rules and they will be monitored for compliance prior to service to them. So we are in the process of instituting the HCBS rule standards into operational reviews. 
uh, through an audit tool that um, we use with the health plan. And that will begin with the next review cycle starting in 2023. Again, as we said earlier, the person-centered planning process is an important vehicle that we use to ensure uh, members have full access to the benefits of community living. Uh, the HCBS rules affords members basic rights in the provision of long-term care services and support. Um, that person center plan is the vehicle to limit access to those rights in the event that they may jeopardize the health and safety of a member um, and or others. And then um, community input, um, as we talked about just a minute ago, um, we rely on your feedback. So if you have concerns about a specific setting, please report that to access uh, using that online portal. Um, again, that link is directly on our website. And here are some of the resources. Um, uh, that's the link to our website. So that's where you can find all the information I've been referring to. You can find a copy of the um, amendment to the HCDS uh, Rules Transition Plan, which has all our updates we've just discussed. And you can also sign up for our email list to understand forms. And then hcbs.azaccess.gov. That is an email address that goes directly to Dara and myself. So if you have any questions about HCBS rules, um, you can submit it via email. We're also using that email to collect public comments. Um, or you can um, physically mail us your public comments um, if you like to as well. Before we move on to the Q&A portion, uh, we want to we want to stress the importance of your written public comment. Um, if you have a public comment you'd like to submit, you can share it with us now, but you'll also need to follow up with an email or a letter uh, sent to one of these addresses to officially submit your public comment. Uh, if for some reason you're not able to write a public comment, um, you can call us and we'd be happy to transcribe your public comment so we have it in writing. We are accepting public comments now through November 14th. Um, so keep that date in mind. You have a couple more weeks. And um, I'm not going to move on to the question slide because I want to keep this information up, but we can move on to questions. So if you would like to speak, you can use that raise your hand function and I can allow you to unmute yourself. So, um, Danielle, Susan had a question about, I've been answering things in the chat, but Susan had a question if we could go back to the slide that showed the placement rate. Uh, in the beginning? It is, yes. Okay, everyone, don't look at your screen. I apologize. There we go. That one? <laughs> there it is. Yep. So, this, um, this information is also provided in our home and community based settings report that we submit to CMS every year. So I'm happy to also post that the link to the latest report in the chat. Um, so I will do that. And then, uh, Danielle, if you could see Susan's question in the Q&A section, I think that one's for you. Um. Let's see, Susan's question in the Q&A section. I am curious how this plan worked during the pandemic when we were told by DHS uh, how to lock down and lock in as licensed facilities, yet still try to meet individuals' rights, access to their uh, community like peers who do not live in licensed facilities. Um, that is why we created the COVID-19 transition plan. We completely understood everyone was on lockdown. We were on lockdown. <laughs> I mean, you can tell we're still at home. Um, so that COVID-19 transition plan allowed providers to explain, this is what we're doing now because of COVID, so we're not going out into the community, um, everyone's staying home or in the setting, um, but when we can, when it's safe, this is what we'll do to get people back out into the community, or this is what we have done before the pandemic, because there's many settings that were fully compliant before the pandemic hit us. Um, so that's that COVID-19 transition plan allowed settings to explain that. So the health plans could still assess to see if they would be compliant once the pandemic um, 
was lifted or was safe to start going out to the community. Um, because we didn't want to wait. I mean, the deadline is March of 2023. That wasn't going anywhere. CMS made that pretty clear. Um, so that was our workaround to still assess providers um, and try to give them some technical assistance if they did need to work on any area, um, but also understand that, yeah, the world was on lockdown. We totally understood that. I see some hands raised. Um, so Juliana, Mar Marin, I apologize if I said that wrong. Um, I am allowing you to talk, so you'll just have to unmute yourself. I believe that uh, should be a button on your screen. I apologize, don't look, don't look. I'm just trying to get the public comment stuff back up. Juliana, were you able to unmute yourself? Uh, yes, hi. Hi, we can hear you. Um, so if I understand uh, correctly, uh, we follow the... Um, Health Department Rule 2, right? That's correct. The HCBS rules are in addition to any other licensure rules you have to comply with. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Let's see, I see Carla has her hand up. I'm going to allow you, I'm trying to allow you to unmute yourself. Not working. She's asking, how do we unmute? I don't know, can, yeah, it's not. Maybe, um, I'm, I'm clicking the button, Carla. It's not doing anything. <laughs> so um, I'm going to continue to work on that to let you speak. Um, Susan, you go ahead and ask your question. I didn't have any issue with you for some reason. And I'll continue to work on Carla's access. Yeah, yeah, the box popped up and I was able to unmute. So can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, okay, so maybe in reference sort of back to the last question that was asked, yes, there is um, DHS rules, and we discussed this at the onset of all of this, that some of them seem to be contradictory to DHS rules in our setting with HCBS guidelines and what they're looking for. My question is, I actually have two questions. One is there's been chatter among mostly among um, assisted living homes about people needing new policy and procedures for HCBS for, for this program that we're talking about. Um, and is that a requirement from you? Is is all text? This will be specific to all text, I presume. So it's all text through access requiring us to have integrated policy and procedures that meet HCBS rules. So, um, so then you. Go ahead, Daniel. Okay. Um, so. Susan, um, we, as part of the assessment process, you have to show, in some cases, evidence that you're doing some of the things that are required under the HCBS rules. It depends on which component it is. You may have to show demonstrated proof that you have a policy procedure about this. Let's just pick the, the visitor's policy, right? The HCBS rules say you can't restrict visiting. Visitors can happen at any time. So you might need to show something in you know, either in a policy and procedure or something you have posted or educational materials to members. It may not necessarily be a policy and procedure, but you have to show that um, what that is um, and that you have that available to members. So it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have like a separate HCBS policy but you need to use, there needs to be documentation or evidence 
um, that can show that in fact you you live out that rule in day to day as you serve members. Okay, if 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 you can still still hear me, um, but am I correct that it would only be your programs that would be looking at that, not Department of Health Services? Correct. Our NCOs are not the the ADHS licensure is completely separate and apart from the the quality monitoring compliance requirements of the MCOs, which now includes aspects related to the HCBS rules. So think of it differently. Think of what the MCOs do as quality monitoring and what ADHS does as licensure. There may be things that overlap, certainly. Um, and I believe there's a question in the chat too around, Susan, what you think may be in conflict. I mean, obviously during COVID, we've we've identified that there's a conflict right where the h2bs rules say go out in the community but you know licensure and other things that were happening at the time were saying no don't do that so we we had created a vehicle through that transition plan to document that yes normally we do these things but now we're not because of health and safety so are there other things susan that yes. i mean we would certainly like to hear because we we've heard about this before but Nobody's been re really able to, to talk about what they felt like were conflicts. And we would well, certainly be happy to have a separate conversation if you felt like in the data, you know, in, you know, in a non-public health emergency time frame, you know, period of time, which we haven't experienced that in a while, what do you see might be in conflict with what licensure may require? So right now, by the example you just gave about not limiting visitation, um, mm -hmm. Department of Health Services has us state what kind of policies and procedures we have in place for visitation, um, which could be different at end of life, say, versus everyday life for an individual. Um, and so if we're following the guidelines um, by HCBS, Anybody can come into the house at any time and visit with their loved one, even if that person has a roommate who goes to bed at seven. And how, how do we navigate that? Yeah, so we've talked about that before. One, you in a roommate situation, you do have to consider other people. But other, like, does it have to be in their room? Can they visit? you know, in the living room, in the dining room? Is there another place that's, you know, when it's what nice weather outside, can they visit outside? So, I mean, there's other considerations. It doesn't, I, I think that there's some common sense, um, you know, applicability here um, around consideration of other people, or if for some reason there was a health and safety risk, such as somebody was gravely ill or something like that, that would cause a health and safety risk for them to have a visitor. But the idea is that that is not applied universally, that whatever restriction might be in place is for that individual and it's documented. Okay, so otherwise, outside of some unique scenario, theoretically, somebody could have a visitor come to the house at two o'clock in the morning and yep. expect to visit anywhere in a and I mean, a house is not very big. We don't have a whole separate room mm -hmm. for visiting, but that should be that should be allowed. Yeah. Now, it's certainly also culturally normative and appropriate for people who live together to set roommate rules, right? So, if Danielle and I were roommates, and Danielle, it would be typical for us if we lived together for. It, let's say Danielle was a night owl and I wasn't. So Danielle liked to have friends, you know, over till three o'clock in the morning. I would probably say to Danielle, hey, you know what? I kind of like to go to bed early. Could we, could we discuss the time? <laughs> that would be appropriate. When we're talking about smaller home settings, this is an appropriate discussion, right? Could we talk about what might be an appropriate time? But the, the key here is that it's driven by the individuals that live there and not by staff or the agency that that determination would be driven by what about the individual preferences of individuals in the home versus the agency setting an hour if that makes sense it's a nuance but it's important to us it, it, it is a nuance and that almost answers my question <laughs> thank you okay mm -hmm. 
So I would so before we go, to, go ahead. Oh, Carla wrote her question out. Do you want to read it? Do you have it, Daniel? Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that's what I was going to do. I wasn't able to unmute Carla. If you're on, if you also called in on a phone, um, you might have to press star six to try to unmute yourself. Um, I'm not sure how that works, um, but for whatever reason, Zoom is not working with me just for you. <laughs> um, but you wrote your question in the chat. Thank you. Your question is, can you give us a big picture of what will change as a result of these rules? On its face, it seems like almost all of the day treatment programs I'm aware of would drastically have to change. Um, so the good news is that uh, we've been assessing these settings for the past um, year and a half, pretty much. Um, so these settings are all aware of what they need to do to comply. Um, it really is for day programs. It's it's um, making sure members have choice. You know, um, if not everyone wants to go to the group activity of going to the zoo, is it is there a way to have it so some people can stay behind? I mean, obviously everyone can't choose to do something different, but just just having some choice. Um, as far as those day programs go. And then having um, community engagement, which could look like someone coming into the setting to you know, do an art class or teach dancing or someone uh, or the group going out into the community, purchasing goods, um, you know, things like that. So um, again, all of these settings have at least one assessment uh, for day treatment specifically, I know DDD is already working on second and third assessments. I mean, they're really on top of it. So these settings should be aware of whatever they need to do to comply. So I hope that answers your question. I apologize for the technical difficulties. And Danielle, uh, I'm going to post the I'm going to post the link to the entire transition plan. And if you go, you can go and search for specific types. And it actually lists out what are the things systemically that have to change about day programs, employment programs. And there's a whole list if you want to delve into the larger document. So I'm also going to put that in the chat. Thank you, Daryl. Um, Susan has asked a follow up question Are each um, all text programs responsible for gathering information from each provider, or do they jo join forces in questioning each setting? So I'm happy to say they join forces. You should not be receiving, if you work or if you contract with um, the elderly and physically disabled plans, you should not have three different assessments. You should only have one. Um, they're, they're supposed to be splitting up this workload. Um, so we hope that's one way to make it a little bit easier on you. I see Juliana, you have your hand raised. You should uh, be unmuted. No, I'm okay. Oh, okay. I don't know why the hand is always, you know, right hands on my screen. <laughs> no worries. I can I'm lower sorry. it on my end. Thank you. Uh, Candace McDonald is asking, does this apply to home health services? Um, so this is specific to home and community-based Setting. So this is specific to um, places where people go to receive services rather than home health, uh, which goes into someone's home. Um, so that would be a no. That's a long answer to no. Uh, Susan says, thank you. That's what I have experienced and I'm happy to hear other groups won't be repeating the process. Yes, we definitely don't want to make this any more burdensome than it has to be. Um, and hopefully all of you guys have already experienced this and now you're old pros and it'll just get easier from here. And I'm always meeting with the health plans and um, brainstorming on ways that we can further um, make the process efficient and easier. So, and Carla, I did send you the uh, transition plan via email, you'll get an email from Dara Johnson.
And I guess it's important to say that, um, you know, while there's a tool, while there's many tools that make up, as Danielle talked about, that make up the assessment, um, there also can be different perspectives of compliance. Um, we try very hard to be consistent, but if, if you're an advocate, you're a member, you're a family member, um, you're somebody who's otherwise interested in a facility or, or setting, um, and you have concerns, um, that is where, Danielle, if you can go back to that page that talks about the portal. And we'll post the PowerPoint and the recording online, but, um, and then send out a notice through the vehicle that you probably receive this information. That's where we want you to share that information with us. You're the eyes and ears in the community. Uh, we can't be everywhere. Um, so if you feel like there is a concern, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, you know, we can follow up, we can ask some questions, um, and we can make sure, you know, we, we need to rely on our community at large to help determine um, if a setting is truly complying. And so, um, you know, uh, we can have conversations with providers about those areas that are raised of concern. Thank you, Dara. And Susan is asking if there's any coordination with the ombudsman program as they are now coming in on a regular basis to inform residents of their rights. Would you like to handle that one? Yeah, we've, I mean, we've educated the ombudsman program about the HCBS rules, but they, you know, they operate independently. They're aware of them. Um, so I wouldn't say there's like official coordination, um, but there definitely has been education um, about it. Um, I think they look at other specific kinds of things. I think the HCBS rules are more programmatic, you know, rights and things like that in, in nature. And it would be really our obligation under the quality monitoring to assess that. Not to say there wouldn't be coordination between an ombudsman and our MCOs and the quality monitoring. I'm sure that does happen. Um, are potential residents able to see records on an individual setting to aid their decision? I mean, we've shared with you, there's a link to the report on our website that outlines the, the findings of each individual setting assessment. I mean, if members want to take a look at that to help inform decisions, they certainly could. Um, we share it as a request of transparency so people can take a look at what those outcome findings were um, for a particular setting, but how they use that information is certainly up to them. I'm gonna go um, back down to the public comments. Just wanna make sure you guys have this information. Um, again, we're taking public comments till November 14th, um, so that gives you a little over a couple of weeks. Um, I know we're throwing a lot of information at everyone to digest, so if you need a minute or you want to go look at the website and familiarize yourself a little bit more before making your public comments, um, you should have the time and you are free to do so. Um, I um, do you want to continue to open it up for questions? We have until three o'clock. Um, so if there's questions, please raise your hand or you can type them in the chat. Um, and I'll take Dara's lead from a webinar we had yesterday. Um, but for the providers on the call, we do want to thank you for your incredible service and brainstorming and um, willingness to help us figure this out during a pandemic and still figure out a way to comply with the HCBS rules. Um, at the end of the day, this is really just about making sure members can be part of their community and that can only be a good thing. Sarah, is there anything you wanna add while we're waiting for questions? Nope, nope, you said that very well. And as Dara said, we'll be posting a recording of this webinar 
um, and the PowerPoint to our, our website, and I'll send out a notice once that's available. It should be later this week. Uh, fingers crossed, I have no more technical issues. Last right, call for I'm any not, questions? Yeah, not seeing any. All right, well, we won't hold you any, you know, hostage any longer than we have to. Thank you everyone for attending today. Thank you for your interaction and thank you for the work that you continue to do. Um, again, you'll be getting emails from me. Thank you, Brandy. I'm glad you could attend today. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.